Our next speaker is one of our newest cornea faculty at Duke and a beloved former resident of Duke, Dr. Kevin Jackson. Uh, he's going to be speaking on the dry eye update, blepharospasm and ocular surface disease. Thank you all. I'm happy to be here. Good afternoon. Let's <laughs> make sure that works. And so, as Dr. Fowler mentioned, uh, my name is Dr. Kevin Jackson. I'm here to talk to you about dry eyes and blepharospasm and how are they connected. So in the past, there was thoughts that blepharospasm treatment leads to incomplete eyelid closure that in aggravates the surface of the eye. The eye then senses that and triggers an urge to blink, causing the blepharospasm. However, recent studies have shown that 40 to 60% of patients at the time of blepharospasm diagnosis, so before they've had treatment, actually have symptoms of dry eye. So that then kind of changed things to make us think that do these patients already have changes on the surface of their eyes that are causing dryness and then causing that urge to blink? And so moving the pathway in a different direction. Or are both of these two pathways playing a role? That's something that we'll talk about a little bit more today. But before we do that, we should really define what is dry eye. And so the Tear Film and Ocular Society back in 2017 came to a consensus on the definition for dry eye and found that it was a four-pronged disease. The first component being symptoms, so that's what we all think about, the stinging, burning, eye redness, excessive tearing, the sandy, gritty sensation, as well as blurred vision and fluctuating vision. The next component is tear film instability, or ocular signs of dryness, and so those are things like punctate epithelial erosions that we can see with staining in the clinic, or decreased tear breakup time. Additionally, there's an ocular inflammation component, as well as neurosensory input. And, and this last component really helps us explain what we see oftentimes in our clinic where we have, there's a disconnect between the symptoms of dryness and the ocular signs that we see at the slit lamp. And so this can happen in two different flavors. There can be too little neurosensory input and we call that kind of neurotrophic cornea. And what happens there is that patients have significant signs of dryness. However, they have very little to no symptoms. The other the other path is for you to have too much or neuropathic signs. And in that case, you have very severe symptoms of dryness, but then when we look on exam, we don't see any signs um, of ocular surface disease. And so what we find is that all four of these play a very key role in ocular surface disease, but specifically in blepharospasm, those patients are more likely to have symptoms and issues with neurosensory input. And so before we jump a little bit further into that, let's just talk about what is a normal ocular surface ecosystem. And so there are three main layers to the tear film. The first layer is the mucin layer and it's closest to the cornea. It's created by goblet cells in the conjunctiva and it coats the cornea and it helps bind the tears to the surface of the eye. The second layer is the aqueous layer. It creates the most of the volume for the tear film and it's created by the lacrimal gland and also contains vital nutrients for surface health. And then the lipid layer is the last layer. It's an oil layer. It sits on top of the tear film, is created by the meibomian glands, and prevents your tears from evaporating off of the eye. And so when all of these things work together well, our eyes feel comfortable and we're able to see very well. However, now let's get to how is the ocular surface then connected to blepharospasm? And we believe that that's through the blink reflex. And so in this bottom image you can see on your left, Whenever you have a sensory stimulus, it travels along the nerve highlighted in blue back to your brainstem. That then synapses with the nerve in red, which is a motor nerve that goes to the orbicularis oculi and causes the eye to blink. And so there can be several different sensory stimuli, which you might notice are things that can trigger blepharospasm. So things like bright light, wind, smoke, particles, but another factor is ocular surface disease or dry eyes. And so what we think happens in blepharospasm is that these neural pathways become hyper excitable and so that they can trigger those very strong, forceful, involuntary blinks. But then additionally, there is environmental triggers. And so if you do have ocular surface disease on top of that, it's continually triggering these hyper excitable pathways that worsen your symptoms. And so now I'm gonna to transition to talking about some possible therapeutic options to treat both dry eye and blepharospasm. And so interestingly enough, botulinum, botulinum toxin is actually an ideal first line treatment for dry eye and blepharospasm because it actually treats three of the components of dry eye, the symptoms, tear film instability, as well as the neurosensory component. 
And so a recent study out of Baskin Palmer found that patients that just have dry eye symptoms, so photophobia, dryness, neuropathic pain, when treated with botulinum toxin around the eye, had a decrease in all of those factors. Additionally, a study by Yabamoto um, out of Brazil found that for patients that had blepharospasm as well as tear film instability, when they got Botox, they actually had an improvement in the blink rate, an increase in the tear meniscus, which is the amount of fluid on the surface of their eye, as well as an increase in the tear breakup time. And that's very interesting because normally when we think about Botox in dry eyes, we think that Botox is going to make the dryness worse. And so what they hypothesize, the reason why this is better, is that when you do have significant blepharospasm, those forceful blinks actually damage the mucinous layer of the tear film. That's the layer that helps keep the tears on the surface of the eye. So as a result of that, the eye can't hold on the tears and it creates chronic areas of very fast decreased tear breakup time, which then can signal that urge to blink in blepharospasm. However, there is still a risk whenever you're using Botox of causing incomplete eyelid closure and causing signs of tear film instability. So we always recommend still following up with a cornea specialist or someone to evaluate your ocular surface to see if there are signs of dryness. Because in addition to that, we always want to optimize those environmental triggers. And I'll talk to you about some of those therapies we have a little later on. <clears throat> Next, I want to talk about the shared neurosensory component between dry eyes and blepharospasm. And so for this, you, we really do require a multimodal approach. And so there is a subset of patients that have dry eye symptoms without signs. And they're at a, what studies have shown is that they're at a high risk of other non-ocular conditions. Additionally, there have been studies showing that blepharospasm patients also have an increased risk of neurosensory conditions like anxiety, depression, migraines, neuralgia, and neuropathies. And so things like healthy lifestyle, neuromodulating medications like we talked about earlier, the FL41 glasses, as well as just underlying treating those non-ocular conditions can be a benefit for those patients. Additionally, there are local therapies like autologous serum tears, as well as preservative-free steroids that we can try to help um, focally on the surface of the eye. However, again, those things are really all focusing on that hyperexcitable pathways of blepharospasm. We also want to see what can we do to try to decrease those environmental triggers. And so in addition to tear film instability, thinking about things like the climate, antihistamine medications, autoimmune disorders, and things like that as well. When looking at optimizing the tear film, what I want, this is a very busy slide, but I just want you to know there are lots of different medications that we have that are minimally invasive that we can try to try to improve the tear film. Some of the things that have already been mentioned um, today are punctal plugs. Punctal plugs are great. Um, there have been actually a few studies that have kind of recommended doing Botox and punctal plugs at the same time to help any patients that have dry eye symptoms as well as blepharospasm. Um, the importance of still coming to see an ocular surface specialist is just that if you do have an inflammatory component to your dry eye, punctal plugs can sometimes make that a little worse. The other thing being scleral lenses, again, a very excellent method because in contrary to normal contact lenses, with a scleral lens, you actually place sterile <coughs> fluid into that lens and then place it onto your eye. It covers the entire cornea and constantly bathes your cornea with fluid during that time. And so it really will treat almost all different facets of ocular surface disease. And so in summary, dry eyes and blepharospasms definitely do overlap. The overlap is complex and likely driven by neurosensory modulation. However, that does allow botulinum toxin to be an ideal first line treatment for patients because it improves their dry eye symptoms. It decreases the blink rate as well as it improves ocular surface metrics as well. However, the overall ideal management likely consists of multimodal therapy which include targeting neurosensory treatments as well as further optimization of the ocular surface. Thank you guys so much.